I recognize myself for five minutes. President Trump began laying the groundwork to delegitimize de the results of the 2020 election well before it even took place. President Trump even insisted over and over that the 2020 election was going to be fraudulent unless he won. He even said it before the election ever occurred. After he lost the election, he continued to use the platform of the presidency to lie to his supporters about the election. Director Ray, I want to ask you, are you aware of any widespread evidence of voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election? And has any new information emerged to support that claim in recent months? Uh, Congresswoman, as uh, former Attorney General Barr and former Acting Attorney General Rosen uh, have both said, and I think I've said publicly, we just uh, we approached it with an open mind, but we just did not find evidence uh, of fraud sufficient uh, that could possibly have changed the outcome of the election. Thank you. So, therefore, do you have any reason to believe that President Joe Biden is not the duly elected president? I do not. On December, thank you. On December 19th, Trump tweeted, and I quote, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election. Big protest in DC on January 6th. Be there, will be wild. Director Ray, is it fair to say that former President Trump was successful in getting his supporters to show up to the Save America rally on January 6th? Well, I'm not sure I could really, you know, weigh in on, on what caused people to show up to what rally. Well, um, it was a pretty motivated group of people, and they were storming the Capitol with big Trump banners and Trump paraphernalia and Trump clothing. And so I, I don't know how you could not acknowledge that it's fair to say that he was successful in getting his supporters, but I'll just, I'll just answer that question that it was pretty clear. Uh, do you agree, Director Ray, that Donald Trump continued to repeat false claims and conspiracy theories to the crowd during his speech on January 6th? Uh, Congressman, as I, as I think I've said in response to some of the earlier questions, uh, I really don't think as FBI director I should be commenting on uh, or weighing in on other people's speech and rhetoric. Um, and so with respect, I'm, there's really nothing okay. for me to so add. So I, I can I, understand I that. I understand the question. I'll just point yeah. out that he told his supporters that the 2020 election was, quote, so corrupt that in the history of this country, we've never seen anything like it. At the end of his speech, he said, quote, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And then his supporters marched to the Capitol, forced their way inside, violently attacked the police, and put the lives of the Vice President, members of Congress, and our staffs in grave danger, all in, a, in an attempt to, to, in the President's own words, stop the steal. The FBI defines domestic terrorism as, quote, violent criminal acts committed by individuals and or groups to further ideological goals stemming from domestic influences. Director Ray, I'd like you to help me break this down. Yes or no, did the attack on the U.S. Capitol include violent and criminal acts that resulted in the temporary disruption of the counting of electoral votes? Yes. Yes or no, would President Trump's months-long effort to spread lies and false claims about a free and fair election qualify as domestic influence that led to these criminal acts? Well, again, without weighing in on particular people's rhetoric, I would say that we consider the attack uh, on the Capitol on January 6th to be a form of domestic terrorism that meets the definition that you just uh, read. Or okay. And so if you connect the dots between the language that President Trump repeatedly used before and after the election to the insurrection and the attack on the Capitol, which you just acknowledged was, does meet the definition of domestic terrorism, then therefore President Trump's incitement logically led to the insurrection and attack on the Capitol. Do you believe the words and actions of the President of the United States then caused in any way, shape, or form the events of January 6th? Was, was a contributing factor in any way? Uh, I, I really can't weigh in on all the different contributing factors. Uh, no, no, I, I'm not I asking would say, you. I, no, no, yeah, no, forgive I, me. Reclaiming my time. I'm not asking you to weigh in on all the contributing factors. I, I just am asking you if the words and actions of the President of the United States from before the election all the way leading up to the attack on the Capitol caused in any way, shape, or form the events or had an impact on the events of January 6th. Well, uh, Congresswoman, let me, let me try to answer your question this okay. way, which is... I think there were a variety of influences that caused different people on January 6th to act. And my understanding is that some of the individuals charged that we have brought cases against for the attack on January 6th have cited that as one of their influences. Okay, so that's according helpful. According to those people, that, 
That's my understanding. That's helpful. Um, and I understand that you'd rather be careful with your words, but we have to confront the truth. Former President Trump cultivated a homegrown terror movement. It was his self-serving lies and conspiracy theories that were the catalyst for a violent insurrection that left 140 police officers injured and five people dead. Let's not shirk from the responsibility to hold Donald Trump, not that you are, Director Ray, but here we are not going to shirk from the responsibility to hold Donald Trump and all other leaders who incited the insurrection accountable and push extremism back to the fringes. Okay. I, uh, my time has expired. And In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate it for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, that. last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, the, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate it for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th 
is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right, and so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out, and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So, um, is white supremacy? It, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.